Welcome to another episode of Kelly and Scotty Podcast. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Today we're going to be talking about the trans, detrans, retrans movement. Uh, we're not quite sure what they're up to, but we're talking about them. And we have our special guest, Michelle, here today. So sit back and enjoy the show. All right, recording has started. Okay. So if so, anyone feels like being foul, they can vicariously swear through me. <laughs> I'll take you up on that. Thank you. I'm known never to swear, so. Uh. So on the topic tonight, we have trans, trans, detrans, retrans. Which sounds like a big trans sandwich. Repent sinner, essentially. I, that's what I think when I hear that. <laughs> Did you well, guys have an opportunity to go and look over that site? I couldn't. Yes. Go ahead. I I can't decide what I think of um, Kinnan McKinnon. Um, is the individual honestly just trying to walk a tightrope where they're um the person is involved with wpath and with cpath um and attempting to honestly study the issue or is it um you need not fear the detransitioners we can bring them back into the fold and this is how we bring them back home they are there. They, we do. We do not excommunicate them. We 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 need to do some serious gender affirmations, and you know, assure them that it's it's okay to be detrans and non-binary. You can still believe in the gender unicorn. You can still be part of the gingerbread our gingerbread family and be detrans. You don't need to walk away from us. We will still love you and accept you. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I've i never met Kenan McKinnon and I, you know, I've read a couple studies. I'm not a researcher. Um, mm -hmm. And I, of course, I have no idea what is in his heart and mind. So I'm not sure what the intentions are. Um, I think I know some people who were wary and seem to speak well of him now, which holds some weight for me, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I wonder, you know, what, what the overall effect is, because I think you're you're nailing something there, right? It's it's creating a space for detransitioners that allegedly, you know, that is coming from that sort of side because it's still kind of steeped in ideas like um, the veracity and importance of gender identity versus biological sex. Mm -hmm. yeah. I it know. still very much uses the conversion, um, the gender conversion therapy language, where um, there's still it's it's. I read, I I I took their latest survey, and um, you know, do you, do you feel that uh, you're now more in touch, or how how they but they, but they use terms like assigned gender at birth it's mm -hmm. like no you know what detransitioners actually believe in the sex binary they believe there's male and female um so i i, I went through it and it was like he's including trans people in this questionnaire like technically a woman who started testosterone but didn't have a hysterectomy or a bilateral mastectomy because she wanted to have children would qualify in his world as a detransitioner because she transitioned and then detrans to have children and then retransitions after she's ready to be infertile. 
Yeah, it's a way yeah. to inflate numbers. I find sometimes that's done too with, uh, you know, desisters and detransitioners. Like, desisters don't yeah. really count, except they do when you're counting trans. Like, I don't, there's something fishy with the way who gets included in which groups. But that's why I brought up that site, because it seems to me that it's pretty um, laden with gender ideology, gender identity ideology language. Um, the gender and, journey. Yeah. And, you know, that might be the case for some people. But then, like you said, what is what is that detransition if you're still part of the whole thing that in my experience, detransitioners like yourself and others that I know, um, those folks who've been, feel they've been harmed by gender medicine, where does yeah. that them that within that, that I, I listened to the symposium from his um, from McKin from Kinnan's previous study, and I was crying at one point. I was listening to a um, therapist speak, and she talked about how she works with clients wherever they are on their gender journey, and when and was working with a client, she had um, transitioned the young girl, and then after working through her resistance and inner transphobia it came out that she really wanted to be a girl so detransition de but as the therapist continued to talk it was evident that the 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 therapeutic relationship was so toxically enmeshed that the client was not able to say to the therapist you did me wrong when you encouraged and blindly affirmed me to transition. And I'm like, I, I, I was crying. The, the woman was speaking for like a half hour to an hour. And I was just in tears because these relationships, these blind affirmation relationships get so toxic that the client who's detransitioning is more concerned about not making their therapist feel bad than to be able to safely speak the truth and say, yeah, yeah, you know, you you made a mistake. You you were the adult in the room. I was the teenager. You were the 30-something year old with a master's degree or a PhD, because that's what you need to have to do this therapy, um, who just blindly affirmed me and didn't really um investigate the back story yeah i uh i think you're speaking to an issue in therapy in general that applies certainly in the affirmation model but i think in therapy in general there's a tendency for people to focus on the idea that the working alliance means that there's a warmth and that you get along and that you like your therapist, which is part of it. But the other part is that you two work together sort of on a shared understanding of what it is you're trying to accomplish in your work. And that will also include, you know, questioning and confrontation. And it might um, mean that, you know, the client gets upset with the therapist and that's that's okay. It's like rupture and then it's healthy. Mm -hmm. I absolutely hated the psychiatrist I worked with for two years while I was going through the transition process. Um, he rarely let me talk during the session. I I was to sit there and listen to him expound. And I mean, he hit deep core issues. He he I, I got about five minutes in the beginning where he'd ask questions, I'd give him some information, and then the rest of the session, the rest of the hour, um, was him giving me information. And then you leave this and I don't really know need to know what you're doing with the information. I just need to know like this is like I need enough feedback to know that you've engaged with people out there in the real world about this. Cause he's like, therapy is not the real world. So I'm here to provide you with information and knowledge from my 
20 years of university education and, and 30 years experience as a psychiatrist. Um, and then you either take it out into the world and work with it. And the answers you will provide me when I see you next month will tell me whether you worked with it or not. And I'll give you further knowledge or we'll end the, we'll simply end the relationship because you're not doing any of the work in the real world. And I mean, some of the stuff he said was like, he's like, you know, you got to understand the average individual when you tell them that you're a woman and you're going to be a man is going to listen. What they're going to hear is you're a human being and you're becoming a dog. That's how much sense this is going to make to the average individual. But we're talking about 2002, 2003, not 2023. Um, and, you know, it would just, I would get so angry. Um, and when I hear therapists talk about the affirmation model stuff, that then the, the work we do on the gender journey, I never hear about a client getting upset or getting um, pissed off or spending months utterly despising their therapist and um, that's an abusive relationship um, I've, I've, I've been listening to some stuff talking about love and um, if you cannot disagree there's no love there because if, if there's love there, then love will survive disagreement. Mm -hmm. Because there, there, will be, there will be enough room for respecting um, differences of opinion. There will be, there will be enough room there for, for respect to occur in the gap between where you're disagreeing. Mm -hmm. um, so in these therapeutic relationships where all the uh, therapist is doing is blindly affirming the client, there's um, Helen Joyce um, describes it so well. I'm paraphrasing her. Um, it creates a crystalline matrix of emotional fragility where anyone says no to these people and they just melt down. And my concern, I think there were three or four trigger warnings in the um, questionnaire. And uh, the language used, um, they couldn't use, the word sex was not in the questionnaire or it was, um, yeah, assigned gender at birth. It's like, no, if you're studying detransitioners, um, like let's, let's have that as a criterion question to determine whether or not this person's really a detransitioner. My one friend got back to me and said, well, there's a lot of trans people who believe in the gender binary, too. And I'm like, yeah, but because <laughs> um, the the qualifying questions were like, do you live in Canada or the United States? Because um, that's the area they're trying. But it didn't. It allowed a lot of people who are still caught up in the queer theory. um ideology to answer the question and I know very few um, detransitioners that I'm in communication with who believe in queer theory anymore it's it's simply they, they've re recognized it as something that's been uh, as a toxic influence on their youth or life or how wherever they collided with it that was my impression when I looked at the material was like, it's all in queer theory. Like, so how much is our detransitioners are, are, are they really supported here? It just seems like the end goal is retrans and we're tolerant of detransitioners and we'll accept them. But it reminded me of being, I was in a very sort of fringe Pentecostal movement and they got cool for a bit and started letting like the skaters and the drug dealers hang out in their parking lot and it was it was a lot like that it was like you have your born again backslidden recommitted right but it was all all the language and all the outreach was very pentecostal based and there wasn't really any room for variance the tolerance was you're allowed to skateboard and do drugs there I mean, but all the language was feeding back into converts for Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. And that's right. what this kind of seems like. 
It's just holding space for detransitioners thinking that they'll come back. Yes. And then, you know, my question would be, one, there's this expectation that people will possibly re-identify um, or if they detransition, but they detransition into another gender identity, that's not really detransition. That's a gender identity shift. Like, that's the fluidity of gender, exactly. Um, you know, there's a certain author in Canada who I think in four years, five years, has had as many gender identities. Um, and that person is a middle-aged adult. But if the qualification is to detransition into being non-binary, for instance, then that, I don't know where the detransitioning is. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Not, non-binary is still a uh, um, tenet of the faith. You're, you're still one of the faithful. That's why with um, Beyond Trans, Gen Specs, program that I'm involved in. I think that that's why, you know, it was decided that it's called Beyond Trans because the idea is um, for various reasons, some people become, they detransition or they're disillusioned or they're disenchanted and they're no longer subscribing to that particular worldview and they've returned to what they consider material reality they don't believe in gender identity anymore and they're more firmly rooted in their biological sex but they still may continue to transition because you know presenting as the opposite sex or is helpful to them in some way or or maybe mm -hmm. you know, they've gone too far and so there's no going back but that the detrans site that Kenan McKinnon has got up, I don't think really captures that. No, no. Um, Cause it's like, um, they would list as a detransitioner, somebody who um, had a surgery. So, so for me, for example, um, like if I'd actually experienced it differently but when i had my hysterectomy i had complications so if as a result of my complications from my hysterectomy i put off my bilateral mastectomy um kinnon would count that as a detrans stage mm -hmm. so so i would be seen as somebody who was transitioning and then because of surgical complications i detransitioned for a time because i put off plans for my mm -hmm. second surgery mm -hmm. yeah. um you know at that stage of my life i was still waiting for the everything gets better <laughs> you know you you accomplish this and then it all gets better i i was still um wrapped up in the um belief that this would fix the awkward feelings i wasn't really looking at the inside stuff i wasn't faced with the inside stuff until i I had to face issues regarding my sexual orientation so yeah i've i've come across that with um people who've transitioned and then due to complications say with um cross-sex hormones they've stopped them because of the they're having you know complicated they're having side effects that aren't working for them Mm -hmm. And they also understand their biology and that transition for them is a an ameliorating medical intervention for something they've tried other ways to sort. And so, I, you know, that person, you know, sometimes those people will refer to themselves as being in a detransition state because they're not actively participating in something. Mm -hmm. uh, I think once again, the language is um, a bit confusing. Like there's no, I noticed on the DTRANS info site, like they don't actually, in the glossary, gender identity is not listed. 
Mm -hmm. which I think is like the whole purpose allegedly of transition is to address that incongruence but they don't even define it probably because there's so many definitions it would be hard well yeah and for me with my regret and journey into some sort of a detransition state um what would my gender identity even be so that um the pink elephant in the room they just completely ignore because am i cis under their rules because i know i'm a woman I, I i know i was born a girl and that i'm a woman today um and i shaved <laughs> to help I me noticed. i noticed i was like in, something in, in, in my journey <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I gotta, I gotta do something here. I gotta, you know, um, and I mean, it's hard to see my face today because I was, I was beautiful, and the testosterone changes that, and those, those changes are, you know, permanent. So for a lot of my journey into regret, I have still I still hid behind the beard because then I didn't have to see see that, and I I, I see that today. Um, and how did I end up down this rabbit hole? Um, I think it's about the the idea of being trans or not being trans or being detransitioned, and sort of how that's complicated by ideas like gender identity and yes so am i trans am i cis am i an f to m to f um when people ask me today i say that i have no gender identity um i am a woman and i was born a girl and uh, the last time i was asked for my pronouns i was like I use I, me, my, my, myself in conversations so that I don't mispronoun myself. Um, I understand how that would be confusing if you tried to use those and talk about me, so use whatever makes sense to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so where, where would they... Where yeah. does someone fit if uh, they're living with dysphoria? Uh, due to a, a perceived incongruence, but they don't engage in any social even and or, you know, biological, medical, surgical interventions. Are they mm -hmm. cis? Like who? Yeah, who determines all these? Well, apparently it's just internal, but then everybody else has to participate. It's, it's tricky, and I think it sets people up for disappointment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I I meant to keep a list of their contributors um from the study. I saw the Trevor Project listed and I had to just disengage with the whole study for about five minutes. Um I didn't note um, a single Sex Matters based organization um, listed. Like, I didn't notice Gen Spec. <laughs> I didn't notice Gender Dysphoria Alliance. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't expect um, Detrans Alliance Canada to be listed because I'm just a little me at this point, you know. Um, but any of the um, any of the organizations that have the basic understanding of sex matters, sex is important, uh, were not part of the process. So how can you how can you be helping detransitioners? How can you be studying detransitioners and yet not consult with? or acknowledge the organizations that did the groundwork and are still wow. doing the work. You know, like GenSpec is out there doing the work. 
Um, I believe they're the only ones thus far who have had a international, um, what's the word I'm looking for, for D-Trans, for D-Trans Day of Awareness. Awareness Day, yeah. Um, convention been. type of situation, yeah. And they've had and, two conferences. We've had two conferences. Kenan McKinnon, by the way, uh, did come for a day at the oh, conference good. in Denver. Um I did not speak with him, but I, I noticed that he was there sort of engaging with people. You yeah. know, my sense is, you know, that I'm just, I assume sort of some positive intention there and that he does want to help people, but he's still operating from within that paradigm. So it's going to... I think people who would benefit from your site and people who go to Beyond Trans and people who look at Genspec stuff, I don't know how welcome they'll feel within an organization that, like you said, doesn't address the elephant in the room mm -hmm. around biological sex. So they... Count detransitioners as someone who's like waiting for something. Yes. The next step. So essentially, if I was, I always bring it back to religion. So a young Catholic boy in a small town and all of a sudden the bishop couldn't do confirmation for a year. I would now be a backslidden Christian. According to trans religion, it would be comparable to that. Like I'm no longer a Christian anymore until I'm progressing to confirmation and the bishop can come lay hands on me. Because I if don't it's have a sacrament. If it's an internal motiv motivation that pauses the process. So your, your scenario works, just shift it from an external pause to an internal, something internal that paused it. That's kind of where they're, the the angle they're coming to it from is okay yes exactly otherwise you nailed it so <laughs> how internal do we go could it be that bishop uh bishop franklin smells like uh blue cheese and i don't want to really have him confirm me and i'm waiting for a different day. yes for a different yes it's internal you've got it <laughs> all right okay i yeah. just wanted to be clear the, the other thing that I'm wondering how it would fit in your analogy, uh, Scott, is what if the internal pause is that there's some sort of internal complication that's preventing you from getting, did you say confirmation? It was confirmation. Yeah. Um, so there's that, but also you do want to continue towards getting confirmation but you've also come to a place in your own belief system that you maybe enjoy some of the community building um, and social supports that you get from the church, but you're not particularly religious. Mm -hmm. But you still want to go and take communion, do some confessions. Like there's something about those rituals that you find comforting and help you negotiate your way through the world. But I would still be considered D-trans. But if you're active, yeah, okay. But let's say, let's say then you, you do get to con get confirmed. And they now retrans. Blocked. Sorry? And that's retrans then. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's retrans. But what about the, the piece around I'm conf I, I've gone for confirmation. I asked whoever the blue cheese guy, he's <laughs> confirmed me, but I don't actually like, I don't really buy all the things that they're selling, but there are some of the things that they're selling that work for me. So you do trans again. Yeah. I and don't you know. do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself about. Oh my God, that's so confusing. You could detrans, retrans, detrans all day long. I, that's yes. what I like beyond, like beyond, like 
we're not that's it's almost irrelevant because it's so, so when, when, when you got to the point of saying what if there was an external circumstance that say okay what if i'm an older apostate or whatever you call them apostle apostate no apostate's a rejected person let's say i'm an older uh, person wanting to get confirmed they usually do that at easter time well what if i got like uh what do you call it shingles my skin was burning and i couldn't have anyone lay their hands on me so would that be detrans yep that, that's a pause in the process see there there wasn't a single question in the entire survey that addressed an issue that i find is pretty consistent especially the younger the individual is and if they were involved in a LGBT2 spirit plus support group, the transitioners get blackballed from them as hateful, harmful, hurtful. And there wasn't a single question about that. Did you get blackballed? Um, did a therapist terminate therapy? Did a doctor refuse to provide you further care after you came out to them as detrans? There wasn't a single question about that. And that is when I, <laughs> the few people who have reached out to me and they're like despairing and in emotional turmoil and feeling completely lost, they're just desperately looking for anyone who will provide them some sort of therapeutic support because it's all it all disappeared on the day where they said no this is not internal transphobia i am really a boy i am really a girl there's such thing as boy and girl and i am either boy or girl and there was nothing about that in the entire survey I have a and there's question. nothing about that on their website that I found. Go ahead, Michelle. I just, I where did you get the survey? Was this were you part of? Did you do to participate in one of Kinnan's studies? Um, and the Prior. other, and then the other thing that I'm wondering if you come up. So first off, for people who would like who are detransitioned or beyond transition or their former healthcare teams are not working for them, at least in terms of therapy, you know, direct them to Genspect Beyond Trans because we have um, resources available to people there. Some are subsidized, partially mm -hmm. subsidized one-to-one -one therapy and also some group stuff. Um, yeah. One of the things I hear, I don't know if you, come across this is when people go to their original care providers and explain to them that they're detransitioning and re-identifying with their sex. Um, they no longer have a gender identity in that in the sense that they perhaps thought they did before. They get misgendered. <laughs> like that it's I don't mean to laugh because it's not funny, but I just find it so absurd. Um, they get often they themed. So mm -hmm. if someone's going from one sex to the other sex, they won't be, they won't properly sex them despite the fact the person's just said, this is what I'm doing. Wow. They, they them them. It's just like, it's wild. I, I, yeah. I didn't see anything about that on the site either. So do you think there is room for that site for people, you know, in Canada struggling with their transition? I would look for some other option. I wouldn't refer somebody there. Yeah. Because it just seems to be, um, we understand that you're struggling with sin and that the sin that you're struggling with is this blasphemous belief that um you're uh, a, a male because you were born a boy and um you know we have we have this uh purgatory we can put you into and when you've when you've repented and you want to come back to the back to the fold back to the faithful um when you when you can went once again quote judith butler <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> when 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 you when you understand 
Foucault's nexus of power, privilege, and authority, um, you know, then we'll we'll allow you back in as a, a, a they them or whatever. But yeah, so um, no, um, I'm aware now of enough other resources that do exist, and Genspec is. Um, the primary one, if somebody's just looking for um, something in general that they can attach to, um, it's more difficult when they're looking within a province for specific therapy within it. However, I do have a, a resource that is able to, has been able to find that for me. So, because people are afraid to put it up online still, right? Yes. The other thing I would invite people to do is there's what used to be called GEDA, the Gender Exploratory Therapy Association, which has recently changed its name to Therapy First. They, okay. have, a, they have a public facing directory. But in addition to that, um, you can email their like general inbox email okay. address that you can find. And you can ask because they're, they may have uh, leads on therapists who do therapy so that's just mm -hmm. talking and exploring and questioning and engaging in the process of psychotherapy around gender related issues um who aren't listed for reasons we know and oh yeah also beyond trans has just for information they also just have a public facing directory that even if you're not looking for anything as a detransitioner but you want a resource uh or to work with someone who uh, whose practice is grounded in material reality. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put these in our in our description. Can can we can I get those names again? We have uh, Beyond Trans. We have Geta. Yeah, Geta is now called Therapy First. I think it's TherapyFirst.org. Okay, I and didn't realize that, that change had happened. Yes. G E N S P E C or C T? C T. Now, um, does this is, I know this isn't North America, but Society for Evidence Based Gender Medicine, would they be a good one to throw in there? Yeah, Sagan has got a lot of um, research stuff. If you're a researcher and you're looking for basically a, like just just the facts, ma'am. Like that's that's your place. Though they are committed scientists, and they follow the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, Genspec has a sister site um, called Stats for Gender. Mm. Um, okay. I think they have more stuff. Like you can go there and Google in. I don't know whatever you want to look at. Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. Um, Rates. You can type that in and then get studies that discuss that, you know, um, or you could type in Jack Turbin and see what. Oh, that was the other name I saw on their list of, uh, like, when I looked at, um, what did they name this D-Trans site? I can't remember. Kinnon's D-Trans site. Turbin's on there under their. Um... I didn't see that. The D-Trans no, trans site, when you go to their, um, not resources, but the the um, research they have backing up what they're doing, uh, Turbin is there. And I'm like, are you for real? I, I know more than one person whose life has been, like, I, I know of a true believer in um genderology and his life was so devastated by the metidioplasty gone wrong that he could not face the um social dis the the the, the dissonance so he was going to access he qualified and um was going to access made um he actually he announced to everyone that you know this is my death date um he decided he didn't want to die in the end but he's completely disappeared um from social media activism because he can't he's got this horrific surgical outcome 
there's nothing that can be done to fix it. And um, he is a true believer in queer theory. Like, uh, uh, and and he 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 the the cognitive dissonance is so high that he is becoming completely dysfunctional. Still and Jack Turbin, Jack, oh yeah, still believes Jack Turbin is the one who did the surgery. And it's like, is he a surgeon, Turbin? I thought he was a second. Oh no! Um, oh, I'm thinking Crane. Sorry. Crane. Crane. Yeah, Crane was one. Yeah, Turbin's the other guy. Um, but Maybe. I couldn't believe they had him on there. Well. I mean, I'm not saying that this is what that site is about, but I've had other people ponder, I've heard other people ponder, if it's just a way to get control of the D-trans narrative. And mm. they have a lot of funding, right? Like, who found out that, I don't even know how much money it was, but like, some guy who goes into an elementary school to talk about gender stuff gets paid through a gal, and it's like, I don't know, was it like $7,000? But there's a lot of there's a lot of funding, and so there's this site, and maybe that's a way of controlling how detransition is talked about. Mm, yeah, Turbin is the one who's controlling the narrative down in the states. Yeah, he's yeah he's, he's driving it. Yeah, there's yeah. Um, Florence Ashley is a big contributor, and Florence Ashley and McKinnon have done a few papers together. Yeah, yes, they very actually isn't that the one who runs the uh the the social media site? For some reason her name or his name came up. They're part of D -tran, or trans D trans retrans, aren't they, Florence Ashley? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. Uh legal yeah. scholar, PhD candidate, I think, at um the University of Alberta and does a lot of research and simply the manner in which they're putting it forward as some sort of a continuum where once trans always trans even if you detrans for a while in the middle where you're still going to make it a trans sandwich yeah and it's like a clubhouse you can just detrans retrans all day long can't even fit that thing into my mouth at the end of the day. <laughs> I'm picturing um I'm picturing this image of uh, the princess and the pea um, that I came across a while ago with uh, a little kid in my life um, friend's daughter, and it was all these mattresses piled higher and higher and higher, like the pea is material reality. And it mm. makes some people uncomfortable on all those mattresses or in that clubhouse sandwich. But as long as you have the mattress in there, you're going to get funding from the government. Mm -hmm. And they are throwing so much money at this. Yeah. It's... But if you were just to talk about the P, no funding. And you're a bigot too. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, I know a lot of um, small organizations who are taking on part of the narrative because they need the funding to provide services for a specific clientele. And in order to, like, there's $500,000 grants that the government's giving out. So for a small organization to suddenly have an extra 100000 dollars a year for five years is a huge difference if, if their budget was otherwise you know 50 or 60 thousand a year to operate because it's just run mainly by volunteers and one or two paid staff right yeah so it's hard to go ahead no go you go i was gonna say it's hard it's hard to counter the narrative when there's so much money tossed at it yeah the funding is kind of mind-blowing to me um the, those documents about a gal and how much funding they got were um sobering and 
then people who don't want to subscribe to that view, sort of there are organizations that have to present like they do. I'm thinking mostly here around women's services um, because if they don't accept uh, trans identified males or trans women, then they lose their funding. Yeah. So it also inflates the numbers of people who are allegedly on side because some people are just forced to even though they would prefer not to because it's interesting um under self-id laws um you know the pink elephant in the room that never gets talked about so men self-id into women's prison mm -hmm. and women who are trans get to self-id as women to stay in women's prisons in Canada, in the U.S. So I understand. Yeah. What's the second part? I missed the second part. What well, we would call women with gender identities get to self-ID as women to remain in women's prison. Men with gender identities self-ID as women to get out of men's prisons into women's prisons. I realized I hadn't worded that well i stay away from affixing trans to a sex because i find that that really discombobulates the issues and just uh, is ob obfuscation it, it confuses the so do you mean using say like trans identified males so men who yeah well yeah. i think what you're saying if i if i'm getting it is Trans identified males um, can claim womanhood and then go into a woman's prison where they have access to lots of vulnerable women because some of them are violent sex offenders. Um, but, you know, if you're a trans identified female, you're not allowed to go into a men's prison. No, you get to self identify as a woman. Because under under the um, as the laws presently exist, self ID is um, the deciding factor. Oh, okay. so women who have transition to become more masculine in appearance get to self ID upon conviction and incarceration as women. Because they're not lining up to go into men's prisons. Yeah, I well, they're not lining up. And I think that there's actually, I mean, I might have misunderstood this. And Heather Mason, of course, would be the one to talk to. Um, but my understanding is there's a policy in place. Like, it's not, once again, there's no consistency. So trans-identified males can make applications to go stay in women's prisons. But trans-identified women, even if they want to go, which why would you, but even if you wanted to go to a men's prison, Corrections Canada will not allow it. Hashtag, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know that. Yeah, I was gonna say hashtag it's a mystery, you know? Right? I'm against that. I think they should go and there'd be so much detransitioning. <laughs> Sorry, that lacks a whole lot of compassion, but go. <laughs> Commit. And I think your point, Kelly, is interesting. Like, you actually have to self-ID on some level. Like, you can't, I can't, if I have to go to prison for some reason. But the detrans, retrans people would say that's detransing. Yes. You're yes, they would say that that is detrans for incarceration and then retrans when you get out. Yes. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Well, that, that works, too, with the trans-identified mm -hmm. males who are violent sex offenders, because I think, like, I don't even know what the number is. I'm really bad with numbers. But, like, the vast majority of them... Detrans uh, when they come out? They offend uh, as cis, they transition while in prison, and then they detransition when they're out. It's a gender yes. miracle. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. I wonder what's happening. I just... Can't, I can't figure it out. Funny yeah. how that works. It's almost like sex is real. What? I have a question for you guys. 
you know, with the with the site, because, I, you know, like I said earlier, I don't know McKinnon McKinnon. Um, my sense is there is some good intentions there and somebody who does want to help. There might be other things going on. I don't know. But that friend of yours who, Kelly, you said is still a true believer. Um, would Kinnon Sight be a source of support for that person? Yes. Yeah. 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 So I guess there is some good there. Yeah. That would be some, that would be a resource if the individual was reaching out for help that they would, he, they would actually feel comfortable accessing. So I'm picturing it kind of like a really, uh, a gay person who has such internal homophobia that the ex gay movement would be a good choice for them. It's almost similar to that. Maybe. Am I off? I've had two drinks. I could be off on that. <laughs> I just, I just have to think about it for a second. But it's like, um, it would give a paradigm for me to love and accept myself as someone who's just short and falling short of the nature that God wants me to be, which in the D trans, trans, retrans would be trans. But in the ex-gay movement would be to become a, either abstinent or not experience those attractions or just more comfortable with my abstinence really it's kind of like that i think it's going to help a small percentage of people yeah it's sort of like still believing in the thing um, still believe that you're you're a sinful person and like the ex-gay you can't accept it. So you still hang on to the ideology that you're really broken. And so that's helpful for them. Like if you really can't, like I want people to not suffer. If you really can't accept that for yourself, then go there. Yeah. <laughs> I want there to be options, but I don't think that's a good option for everyone. Because most people want to love and accept and integrate all of themselves into life. Mm -hmm. And if you're D-trans, I think that would mean not going along with queer theory, theory language. And if you're gay, it would be not going along with ex-gay language. Mm -hmm. It's like conversion therapy. Well, it is. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's converting them back into the true fold. Yeah. But you're, you're, you're allowed to convert people into being different. You're just not allowing to convert them into being not different. Like that knife only cuts one way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't want them not to exist, but I don't think they help a great many people. You know, it's, I, I don't know. I mean, I think your, your point, Kelly, which honestly I hadn't considered that um, they're just really those surveys that Kinnan is doing is sort of, there's some confounding variables there because they're including people who still subscribe to the entire worldview as detransitioners. And yes. I have heard from someone who attended that symposium, I think it was um, at York. I have not seen it. Um, but their sense was that most of the detrans voices um, of people who spoke there were primarily people who seem oh they're fine you know with their transition and it's just part of their gender journey and it's just helped them become more of who they are they love themselves whatever they're still part of the fold yes yes that's where i talked about the toxic over enmeshment where the detransitioner is more concerned about the feelings of the therapeutic team that transitioned them than they are about the viol feeling their own the violation. They they can't they can't um, they can't feel that. It's like um, my mother married a pedophile when I was less than three years old. It's part of my backstory. I just want to explain. Um, so when I was like seven eight years old i was a little kid 
I needed a father's love. And I loved the man who abused me. Yeah. As an adult, I needed to process through that and just feel the anger. And forgive the little kid for needing the needs that I had for a father's love. These detransitioners have never been allowed to just feel that anger. They're so caught up and overly concerned about the emotions and the feelings of the doctors and the therapists who transition them that they cannot say, I'm angry. I'm pissed off. This changed the, you know, they can't, they can't say that. And that's, it's a continuation of whatever self-denial, whether it's their needs, their perspective, their feelings, their anger. It's the therapeutic relationship really just continues to be a form, like you said earlier, of abuse. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, I think that you have to feel that anger to be de really detrans. I think you do. I mean, when I, I came from a place where I really rejected my faith and I was really angry, but then I've kind of embraced it in a, in a healthier way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that, uh, if you can't do, if you're not let able to do that, you haven't really detransitioned. No, because you're still stuck in that mindset. You're still talking. There's just it's just part of my gender journey. It's... No. Yeah. It, it, um, it, 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 it hurts just listening to them. I bet it does. I've heard. Um, I've you know watched some podcasts uh, that you've been on, Kelly, and I'm aware of that backstory, and it's uh, your backstory, and it's it's heartbreaking. Um, and also, um, I am awed by your courage to take the steps that you, that you have and like being vocal about those things and not having a large community to support you in that in Canada, because everybody's terrified of everything up here mm -hmm. and to face that anger and forgive that little girl um, and to, you know, sit with all those pieces of yourself and uh, shaving, shaving, shaving your beard. So, you look great, by the way. You do. I concur. Thank you, Scott. You look shiny and radiant. Mm -hmm. nice. I appreciate that. It's nice that to means see. a lot coming from a gay guy. <laughs> <laughs> The rose in your cheeks, you know, it looks. It feels so wonderful because I don't know if you've ever um, shaved an area where you had hair and then you don't have hair, but it's just, it's so sensitive. Like I feel temperature, slight temperature change, the breeze, when I touch it, it's, it, yeah, it's still. It's still in that new, new, new stage. Mm. Like taking off a ring you've worn for months and months and months and months, and then you can feel it not being there. Yeah. But, I made the mistake of shaving my head completely in the winter on the West Coast. Oh, I felt every little tiny <laughs> raindrop, every like molecule of mist was, was like searing pain on my head. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm going to stay with shaving my head. I think that's going to be more feminine than growing a fin fringe. When did you shave your face? Because I was trying to think of how, why you looked different at first. And I was like, oh, she's not wearing a hat. And I'm like, and then I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, today is Wednesday, so on Monday. <laughs> on Monday. Yeah. Had you, uh... that, 
that was painful because I wasn't prepared to do it. Um, I just know it, knew it was time to do it. So the pair of scissors I found, because you got to cut it off before you shave it. I learned that the hard way. Um, was like really dull, but I'm like, no, this has got to happen tonight. <laughs> I found a razor that I'd already used to shave my head once, so that wasn't very sharp. But... Mm, you were committed. You were getting yes. it done. It, it needed to happen. Yeah, the second time when I shaved last night, I was more prepared. I got some nice oily shaving gel to use and fresh razor. <laughs> Even mm. it up, but yeah. I think, time to figure this journey i think we should wrap up our conversation it's been a good chat yes yeah, thank you so much. About i really wow. appreciate your willingness to have this conversation michelle thank you wow thank you both for having me on um scotty and i have met not irl but outside of social media stuff and um, okay and uh, I've been sort of following your story, Kelly, since that first podcast, or I don't know if it was the first one, maybe it was the second one, at Gender Dysphoria Alliance with you and Scott and the two Aarons. Oh, yeah. I miss being involved in that. I, I miss that a lot. Thank you for letting me know yeah. that. So um, it's really, you know, I'm a bit of a fangirl, so I'm really... <laughs> Happy to have been invited on oh, the podcast. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and so maybe um, there used to be, of course, we know another D-trans organization in Canada, and that one's sort of gone to the wayside, but maybe, um, I don't know if your site uh, is listed at places like Genspect and Beyond Trans, but maybe, you know, we could do that and that'd be awesome make sure that that'd be amazing yeah yeah that people are aware of um a community for detransitioners in canada specifically it's kind of different landscape here than other places so mm -hmm. um working on the background like i want to get a um physical place um an acreage where people can be on and join together maybe even have like a conference or something um but yeah i'm i'm still spinning the how to how to figure out to get that started and but yeah i'm gonna add detrans alliance to the comments too detrans alliance can oh, excellent and maybe yes. like by the end of this uh conversation of trans detrans retrans enough that i can come live on the acreage <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, sometimes I wonder <laughs> with the government funding, why people just don't ID. I mean, once you've got the trans umbrella, like I don't even know anybody really who doesn't fall under that. So mm -hmm. sometimes I, I think about just applying for the funding on the basis that I am. I think to break this, either everyone has to stand up tomorrow or absolutely everyone has to claim a gender identity tomorrow and get mm. social funding. Well, break the bank. <laughs> <laughs> I am at a stage of going where if a person has declared pronouns on their social media profile, they're trans. Because it's like it's it's just it's 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 a it's like a public proclamation that i am a christian exactly it, so what they're saying is i am a true believer in gen gen genderology i have a gender identity well no different than john 316 on there right yeah yeah exactly there's also people who don't know what they're doing because of the near media blackout in canada that was going on for so many years that's only sort of recently broken I think a lot of people, you know, still think it's the new gay and they want to be supportive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know that they they know that they're claiming um, a gender identity. I don't, I'm not sure that they get that. No, no, most don't. 
you know, if you think about wanting to do a conference and you're not, uh, you don't already have an acreage and stuff, um, maybe after this we could talk. Um, I, there's a place I know that does um, hosts conferences for nonprofits and they tend to be probably more affordable. So we could chat okay. about Beautiful. All right, let's sign off, everyone, because I'm sure we could talk all night. We could. Yeah. Okay. Good night. Hey, good night, Thank everyone. You so much. Bye. Thank you.